indirect suggestion. A direct suggestion appeals to the conscious mind and if we're in agreement with the suggestion and have the ability to carry it out then the suggestion is successful and we carry it out in a voluntary manner. If I suggest please close the window you'll close it if you think it's a good suggestion. Now if the conscious mind was able to carry out all types of psychological suggestion then psychotherapy wouldn't be needed obviously because any sensible person would be able to suggest that people with problems should give up the problem the phobias or what have you that would be the end of all problems so obviously it's not all that simple Psychological problems exist because the conscious mind doesn't know how to create the change necessary to remove the problem. In many situations there is a capacity for change, but nothing can occur without the help of an unconscious process that takes place on an involuntary level. We can try hard to remember a name. We've all been in a state of really scratching our head, trying to remember, trying to remember, but we have to cease trying in a few minutes. A little later, the name pops up into the, our awareness, into consciousness. Now what happened? Obviously a search was carried out on a conscious level, but it could only be successfully completed by an unconscious process carried out on its own even after consciousness abandoned the effort. Now monitoring experiments carried out suggest that an unconscious search continues at the rate of approximately 30 items per second even after the conscious mind has gone on to something else. We know that, we, we, we remember the name and Along with the name comes a lot of allied information about well, what the person had to do with. Indirect forms of suggestion are approaches to initiating such searches on an unconscious level. It's a way to initiate an unconscious search for a solution to a problem. The older idea was that the subject passively did what the hypnotist asked by droning on and on, repeating the same suggestion over and over. The subject was programmed to accept one fixed idea. Obviously, you'll realize now that it's, it was a very naive view of direct suggestion being able to make a subject do what the hypnotist wanted. Now, never forget that Direct suggestion has its place in therapy, but remember this. It isn't what the hypnotist says, but what the subject does with what is said that is the important thing, the essence of suggestion. In hypnotherapy, the words of the therapist evoke a complex series of internal responses in the subject. And these internal responses are the basis of suggestion. These internal responses utilize the subject's unique life experiences and learning. Indirect suggestion doesn't tell a person what to do. Rather, it explores and uses on an unconscious level what is within the person without a conscious effort of direction. All indirect suggestions automatically evoke these unconscious searches and processes within us, totally independent of conscious will. Now they, the indirect suggestions, are most useful for exploring potentials that do exist in all of us. 
and conditions are created which are enabled which enable us to utilize those potentials rather than as I said before imposing control over behavior now we now know that the mind is in a continuous state of growth and change creative behavior is in a continual process of development and to make efficient to make effective use of the mind direct suggestion programming whereas it can influence behavior it doesn't help to explore and use a person's unique potential on the other hand indirect the interspersal approach is an excellent way of presenting suggestions so that the subject can unconsciously respond and utilize them in his own unique unique way now one can <coughs> focus a client's attention through indirect association that's really a basic form of indirect suggestion whereby one raises a relevant topic without directing it in an obvious way to the subject as an example the easiest way to get a man to talk about his wife is to talk about one's own wife or wives in general a natural indirect associative process is set in motion within the man that brings up apparently apparently spontaneous associations about his wife since you don't directly ask about his wife the usual limitations don't apply limitations of sort of conscious set habitual mental frameworks even psychological defenses they don't exist In therapy, we can use this process of indirect association to help a person with his problem by anecdote, stories of other clients, metaphor, all sorts of things in seemingly casual conversation. If this common focused association material has a relevance, stuff that you're talking about has a relevance to the client's problem, then that client is able to think more freely, talk more freely, in a surprisingly revealing way. If you as a therapist haven't hit on the correct indirect associative material, then the subject simply won't talk about the focused association because nothing has been triggered off in them. Now one excellent thing about this interspersal approach is that you as a therapist avoid imposing your own views on the client. You avoid interpretation. If there's anything of value for the subject in what you say, then he will respond. If there isn't anything of value, nothing is lost. But if it is of value, he will recognize it and is able to use it to help with the problem. Individuality. One thing that's very important to know is that we're all different, that no two of us has the same way of experiencing the world. Erickson. Now the first consideration in dealing with clients, patients, subjects, is to realize that each of them is an individual. There are no two people alike, no two people who understand the same sentence in the same way. And so, in dealing with people, you try not to fit them to your concept of what they should be. You should try to discover what their concept of themselves happens to be. Ever since I don't know how long, good phrase that from Eric's, psychiatrists and psychologists have been devising the theoretical schemes, disciplines of psychotherapy. Freud contributed very greatly to the understanding of human behavior and he did a great disservice to the utilization of understanding human behavior he developed a hypothetical school of thought which could be applied according to Freud to all people of all ages male or female of all degrees of education in all cultures in all situations 
and at all times. And so it is in all schools of psychotherapy. Now, regardless of how or when they start, we all have personal beliefs about what constitutes normal behavior, useful goals, intelligence, and so on. And any time you communicate with another person, what you communicate will be an expression, a manifestation of the beliefs that show your personal model of the world. And therein can lie a danger. You've learned certain, you have learned certain ways of understanding the world of behavior and experience, and you can easily fall into the trap of trying to imbue your clients with those same understandings. As an example, if you found happiness from speak, speaking your own mind on all occasions, then that's the sort of thing that you'll teach your clients. You'll teach them that is the way to proceed in life. If you find relief from your problems by meditating, then you'll try to persuade your clients to meditate. Now, obviously, your function as a therapist is to assist people in changing or in gaining a new belief and a new standard or a new behavior. But the kind of changes that therapists so often try, uh, try to achieve are those that are consistent with the therapist's model of the world rather than being a function of and in relation to the client's model. The point is, your private and professional beliefs and standards and rules do not show all that is possible to the client. They only limit what is possible. It will suit only a few. And when you do this, you are in effect stating that what is effective for one can be effective for all. One thing about Milton Erickson was his ability, consistent ability, to succeed with clients of every kind of background and with every kind of problem. And what made it possible for him to succeed was the changes he made in a client's beliefs or behavior. They were always in relation to that client's model of the world. He wasn't uniformly effective just because he hypnotized people. He was effective because he used hypnosis in a way that fitted a person's model of the world. He wasn't successful just because he knew the correct treatment for each kind of problem. It was because he used the client's model to create an appropriate chain. Now having said that, Milton obviously was no exception in that he held certain beliefs and generalizations that inevitably influenced his therapy. But Erickson had a way of looking at and grasping human behavior and its consequences, and of organizing therapy in a way designed to take into account each client's model of the world. One thing I'm able to say is your ability to achieve rapid and effective and lasting change in a client will be remarkable by following the Ericksonian method. It's a very graceful way of achieving rapid and effective change and elegant way. Erickson, patients come to you and they don't know exactly why they come. They have problems. And if they knew what they were, they wouldn't have come. And since they don't know what their problems really are, they can't tell you. They can only tell you a rather, con rather confused account of what they think. And you listen with your background and you don't know what they're saying. But you'd better know that you don't know. And then you need to try to do something that induces a change in the patient. Any little change because that patient wants a change, however small, and he'll accept that as a change. He won't stop to measure the extent of the change. He'll accept it as a change, and then he will follow that change, and the change will develop in accordance with his own needs. 
much like rolling a snowball down a mountainside. It starts as a small snowball, but as it rolls down, it gets larger and larger, and it becomes an avalanche that fits the shape of the mountain. Erickson knew that when a person came for therapy, he had already done everything that he consciously knew to try to change himself. Never forget one thing. Everyone who comes to see you has been, is able to, and will be able to, solve almost all the problems that life puts in his or her path. They cope satisfactorily and most of the time, but they are unable to cope with the one they present to you. And if you ask a client what he has done to try to solve that problem, he will tell you precisely what will not work in making the change he needs and he has only come to you because he is unable unable to use personal resources to satisfactorily handle his problem. Undoubtedly you'll get around to reading as much of Ericsson as you can and you'll read example after example of clients being provided with experiences that seem to have little or no connection with their problem but which proved most effective in achieving therapeutic change. Dealing with every action. When you're a hypnotherapist, one thing you will have to deal with is every action. An unpleasant response that can and does occur when a person is in trance, and they can be spontaneous, very, very spontaneous indeed. If you remember, I've said that people store their unpleasant memories in a representational system which is out of conscious awareness. Those memories are too painful to keep in awareness and so they get repressed. If they weren't pushed down, they would overwhelm their conscious mind. Now this isn't an unusual state of affairs, it's one of the functions of the unconscious. Now one of the things you should be attempting to do with your clients is bring all representational systems into conscious awareness so that they have more choice of response to situations. This means that at any time this repressed material can surface. Even when you're not trying to bring other central systems into awareness, this repressed material can suddenly be released. It often happens in the trance state spontaneously. It's a very natural response as though a guard has been lowered and no longer holds down the unpleasant memory or something that was said, su suggested or made, uh, uh, said by you in the, the induction triggers off something, triggers off an apprehension. Now an apprehension, someone bursts into crying, might even be screaming, sobbing. What do you do? Well, you do not shut up and ignore it. Do that and the whole experience is strengthened and you've allowed the person to suffer pain and anguish unnecessarily. So pace what you see. Pace. Lots of ways of doing it. You have feelings that are not easy to bear and your tears are tears of pain and discomfort about the past and you are uncomfortable. Now lead. As you remember, as you re-experience those particular feelings again, I'd like you to know that most of us in our own past have had many experiences, some of them very unpleasant experiences, but all these experiences, whether we label them good or bad, are there to be understood so that we can learn from them, so that we can be more mature and wiser. People who've not had these experiences do not develop into the mature person that you are able to be because of what you have experienced. And it is fortunate that you are able to look at things in a different way, 
sense things in a different way just as you did when you were a little child and bent over and looked at a different upside down world from between your open legs you survived those experiences from the past and now you can really learn from this seeing feeling them again so that you can include these new learnings into your future behavior and so be more mature and wiser it's just one way many ways another way would be to ask him when he starts the apprehension to swiftly to see himself experiencing to step outside of himself and watch with interest what is happening know that you survived that experience and now watch and listen to what is happening so that you're able to learn from what is happening to learn and then take those new learnings into your future knowing that your younger you didn't needlessly suffer that you're going to gain from that suffering but never forget that sometimes when a person goes into trance with a relaxed feeling that occurs tears can gently run down the cheeks he may not be crying he's just relaxing so don't immediately think that it's the start of an unpleasant experience stay out of content and just incorporate process and as the tears slowly go down your cheeks know that you are fully protected and become more and more comfortable working with process and that really does upset you and you are really responding and that is a really powerful response and you can learn to respond in different ways when it's an unpleasant response and you can be pleased and have a sense of satisfaction in knowing you survived that experience of the past so that it need never happen again know that the unpleasant experience from the past forms a foundation for strength now and in the future it's pleasant to remember how unpleasant past experiences were and how we can learn from them. Take a response, talk about new learnings, and you build a positive foundation for change. Now, some people have a very, very strong, seem to have a very strong survival mechanism, and they, they cannot remember the past, and there's a fear of awakening old memories. Now, initially, make certain that the memories that come out are pleasant memories you can deal with the real problem stuff in drips and drabs later but without hypnosis in the conscious state in the conscious state talk about the unconscious protecting you even as it does in dream allowing you to dream only as much as it thinks fit etc etc and it has protected you all your life from remembering things that might be too painful to remember still allow the unconscious to do its work of protection even when you're in trance as you go into trance let your memories be pleasant and enjoyable let them be good memories let the memories that are uncovered let them be good memories and let the unpleasant memories be put to one side to be sorted out at some other time and know that even unpleasant memories are able to be looked at in a comfortable way and know also that even so-called negative memories can be treated from can be sorry learned from when seen and heard or felt in a different way this helps to reassure a person and helps rattle because you are also saying you want to help the unconscious mind to protect and of course at the same time you're laying a foundation for retrieving memory now remember this, hand reactions are not bad, they're not dangerous, they're not difficult to, ha to handle. People tend to not want to remember because it is looked upon as being painful to remember. If the memory is painful, then a person will shy away from it. So protect the person from the pain in every way possible. One problem, of one thing, of course, incidentally, is that so many therapies teach that pain must accompany change. And when the two are linked like that, 
people don't want to change it's not because they don't they're against change it's uh, they're only against the pain they've been told will accompany it make it easy and people will change 